Hey, welcome back, everyone. Today we want to um, continue our web and the network security introduction with a particular focus on the man in the middle attacks and, and as well as the TLS, transport layer security. Um, just a little bit an announcement. First, COVID wise lecture this Thursday. Someone will explain a little bit more about what this app is about. It's about contact tracing. Um, and uh, we do encourage you to all install it. Um, it will be a fun, fun lecture. Uh, if you haven't joined Piazza, please do. This is just extremely useful uh, Q&A platform. Ask our TA if you have questions so with uh, account creation. It's not too early to think about the class projects and, and class project that I think in my mind is uh, the, the most interesting part of the class of the of this course because you just have so much freedom doing things like things you want. Um, you define the topic as long as security broadly related, it will be fine if you want to do things like, you know, music video, that's obviously is out of the picture, but think anything that you can contribute um, to alleviate the COVID crisis, um, network security, software security, web security, organization, enterprise security, big pictures, emerging technology, hot topic, right? Deep learning, deep learning, everything, right? Um, interdisciplinary project, think of security plus X. I have uh, collaborations uh, across different colleges at Virginia Tech, and there's just a huge demand of data-driven science. And whenever there's data, you talk about uh, um, security uh, system, and, and, and so it's, think broadly. User-oriented security, we talk a lot, a lot about technologies, but eventually people have to use them. Developers have to use the code scanning um, tools. So how can you design solutions that are more user-friendly, that um, you put yourself in people's shoes to think, hmm, will people actually want to use this technology? Um, security education and uh, democratization of security knowledge and, and it's a mouthful but it's just it's security is something that everyone is impacted right so as well if you use credit card if you do uh, e-commerce so you will be impacted and if you use a computer you may be vulnerable to ransomware attack but then the knowledge of cybersecurity is only limited to a, a handful, I mean, a small number of experts. And so how can we all work hard to benefit the general public, teach them, uh, tell them how to do things, principles, explain this in layman's language, a lot of very interesting opportunities. Um, you probably don't have time to go down this out just to pick a couple. And so for example, software security, um, I, my research area um, is on, uh, currently there is a stress on code repair, code suggestion, because developers usually uh, are, it does not have the training, security trainings, and then APIs are difficult to use, security APIs. And so, you know, maybe we can have automatic code generation that generate a better code. Um, how, how can you do it? You, some of this will depends on using deep learning neural networks. Uh, and neural networks has been used for image recognition, natural language processing. Programming language is just another language. It's not natural languages. But it has a lot of language as elements since it's a sort of a string, right? And once you're, you've seen the first um, the prefix, so you kind of know what's coming up. And so it actually has more rigid structures. Although natural languages are easier to tolerate errors if you say, uh, if you meant to say apple, but then you, you say orange or you say fruit, you know, people understand. But then if you make this kind of mistake, if you expect to, to, uh, to have a digital signature, but then you get hash function, you know, it's, it, it doesn't work. 
um, enterprise security, um, defense in depth. Everyone talks about it now, but then how how to do it? Um, and Google Earth, right? Emerging technology. There in security research community, there are some researchers who is just devoted to emerging technology. Essentially, whatever is the hot and new, they would do that security. Um, you know, think of like IoT security, um, CPS security, um, you know, deep learning um, security, you know, like attack deep learning models or use deep learning uh, algorithm to solve security. And the other day I, I was watching Google Earth it, they just have amazing amount of images, uh, you know, from satellite, from airplanes, uh, you know, videos took from airplanes, images, and cars, and then they piece together. You basically, every corner of the earth, they have an image for it. And then, so, um, you know, I'm just curious, is there any way to use this? Um, but, you know, some of them may not make sense, but, but you know, think about it. Um, hate crime, hate crime detection on social networks, right? User-oriented security using deep learning. Um, and so, so I think, you know, just I want to show you no idea is too crazy, okay? So, and we will have three steps. We'll have a uh, project proposal. This is where you tell me a little bit about what you're thinking and I'll give you feedback say this is and someone done that or this is just too specific, this is too broad, this is too weak, uh, or this is, a, well, this is wonderful, keep doing it. And um, so oftentimes when you pick topic, you want to um, pick something that you know a little bit, you sort of have a little bit of knowledge, um, uh, and you have some intuition, you know, even, though, even if you don't know too much, but then you sort of like, Hmm, this is interesting, right? So you you look for those kind of inspirations. Um, it, the, I would say you really don't have to do things that you hate. Okay, if you say, oh, I, I you know operating system security, I, I you know I don't like operating system. I think it's very boring. And but then I for I I you know someone forced me to do OS security. No, no one forced you to do anything. I want you to do something that you somehow have some intuition, have some um, interest in it. That's very important, okay? Curiosity driven. And so uh, think about what you like, what you need, what you think are important, and everyone is different. A lot of people ask before in other classes, whenever I say class project, and then you know, people are like, how do you grade the class project? First of all, grading is um, not important. And, and almost before you ask that question, you should know how you'd grade it, okay? If you are me, you are an instructor, how would you grade a project? You look at, okay, is this, is this a, first of all, relevant, relevant, relevant topic? Is this some, something useful, right? Novelty is something new. It doesn't have to be like out of this world, that kind of brilliant, okay? So, I mean, how many ideas are that brilliant? Not very many. But it, it has to be something that other people haven't done. But it also has to be useful, okay? If it's, it's sort of like other, nobody have done it, but kind of like a stupid idea, that, then I would advise you not to do it. Um, and, and the most important thing is the amount of work you invested into the project, which I can obviously tell judging based from your uh, presentation, uh, from your write-up at the end. And so, so if you pour a huge amount of effort into the project, I would be able to tell and you will have a better grade. Um, and I do encourage you to think something that you contribute, new contributions, okay? New contribution in the form of new algorithms, new methods, new code, and new design, new attacks, new insights, new findings, or new organization of existing knowledge. And, and so in, um, if 
uh, you say, you know, I have a better way of describing this attack in a more insightful way, that's probably is fine too. I, I think, you know, go for the, um, uh, you know, but, but then very straightforward a survey, a review, like, okay, I read a whole bunch of paper and, and I'm going to just somewhat to repeat what people have said before. No. No meaning that I don't encourage you to do it. I discourage strongly um, in that kind of uh, project. Think what you can invent. And a lot of times that you do have to evaluate. And, and so if you say, okay, I want to have a new way of authenticating users instead of two-factor authentication, you know, maybe like face recognition, okay, have some sort of face, face database for all Virginia attack hockeys. And, and then, um, and so, yeah, I mean, that, that I think is very interesting. Have a little bit of demonstration, okay? Don't just think, also do. Um, and there's a lot of free face recognition software. Uh, um, do a little bit of experiment. Most of you are seniors in your last year of uh, college. And so you should be able to uh, be able to define a project and define a demonstration and be able to um, uh, do some hands-on component of it. And of course, I'll be here uh, to help you. Um, if you don't know how to demonstrate, if you don't know how to evaluate, um, talk to me. Um, and so, so um, I encourage you to all think outside the box, think very hard and start thinking now, okay? So that's for class project. Uh, threat intelligence that we talked about this, uh, I just uh, received a, a notification. There is uh, an organization, this is, um, I gave a, a seminar there as well. Um, had they, so it's, it's a sort of like, um, I think the organizer is from, somewhere, some part of DOD, but then they, they have uh, uh, regular webinars uh, from researchers, um, companies, and managers, and so, th so they, they talk about threat intelligent on September 17, you do have to register, okay. Let me recap from uh, the topics of, uh, topics from last semester, uh, lecture, client server model, network protocols. We talk about digital, dig, digital certificate, we'll say a bit more. Um, in certificate authority, those are, are the entities who generate certificates, public key certificate, the endorsing other people's public keys. We're gonna explain why, why is that so, so, so important. Um, and, um, server authentication and so on. In the middle attack, we mentioned it last time, we'll um, discuss it more today. So mutual authentication, if you all remember last time we said that mutual authentication is very much needed. Um, client and server authenticate to each other, which goes first, we said that the server need to do first Server needs to go first, the server needs to prove itself first. Otherwise, a client would just send the password to the wrong server, which could be an adversary. And threat model in this, in, in all the networking cases, it's essentially the attacker can intercept, replay, um, forge, tamper, impersonation, uh, those kind of, um, threat model. So, so we begin with a simple experiment and in, in the good old times when we do in-person class, I would invite some students to the front and I, I have some dialogues that I print out and, and I have someone play server, play um, client and then someone play a hacker. And so it's really a fun um, thing, sort of cybersecurity theater, okay. Um, but, but now we, we have to do it in the form of um, PowerPoint animation right now. 
Um, so suppose the applying server authentication protocol works like this. And you obviously know this sounds like a very insecure one, yeah, straw man, okay? Suppose, suppose you have something very simple in order to authenticate, um, in order for, for clients or to establish connection. And so you have say, hello client, uh, hello server, okay? Is, um, and the server says, what's your username? My username is Alice, and Alice, what's her password? And my password is blah. Okay, if this matches with the server's record, then server says, I oh, welcome. Otherwise, uh, I say, try again. So, not good, not good. Why is this not good? Okay, so we'll see why is this, why is that protocol vulnerable to men in the middle attacks? So you have, okay, uh, the client says, hello server, and, but then the client was fooled into communicating with an attacker server. And, and think of this as a, you know, like phishing email, like spear phishing or mass phishing or clicking on the wrong link. And, and so for whatever, premise that leads to this client talking to uh, someone that is not the server, okay? So which, which could happen. And then um, at this point, the, the client, the innocent client would tell the, the, the man in the middle that the, um, her username, which is Alice. And then on the other side, the immediately the Man in the middle, the adversary get in touch with the real server, okay? And they engage in the protocol as well, okay? And pass down an Alice username. At this point, the server will ask the man in the middle, what's your password? And we all know the hacker doesn't know. But then the hacker turn the head around to Alice and ask Alice, what's your password? Alice tells the hacker the password the real password and now bingo hacker has what all the information it, it, it needs in order to impersonate alice in front of the, the real server right so the server now established connection with the hacker the hacker now established connection with alice um and so if say this is a bank right alice want to check out her bank balance which the hacker doesn't have, does not have the bank database, but then would always be able to relay the messages back to the bank server and then relay the, the account information, the transaction and so on back to Alice. And so from Alice's point of view, there's nothing wrong, but then all communications are intercepted by the hacker. So this is the man in the middle scenario, right? So, so which is bad and hopefully this is not happening and, and that's indeed the, uh, the case because we use TLS, transfer layer security, which is a much, much complex uh, protocol than the one that we showed there. So, um, so, so the, the key problem in the previous scenario is that the client released the password to the fake server, okay? So, so that shouldn't happen. That shouldn't happen. So the server need to um, really prove who it is first, and, and the user has to be able to tell. Okay. So in reality, what is the correct solution? It's called the transfer layer security TLS. Um, it used to be called secure socket layer, and then that is uh, deprecated. That name is deprecated. A lot of times. A lot of time people still do TLS slash SSL. Um, and it's, it's important to know that it's still very much evolving, actually evolving protocol. There's um, um, last year, there was an ACM6, uh, there's a security dissertation, best dissertation award given to a, a, a PhD uh, student, a former PhD student who, um, improved on TLS security on the implementation TLS 2.0. Um, so it's just don't don't assume that oh all of these things 
were invented uh, a long time ago. It's already mature, established, there's nothing wrong with it. No, 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 everything is evolving, okay? So, um, and, and so, but TOS is between the application layer and the transport layer. On the right-hand side, this is a five-layer network stack. And there is, sometimes you'll see seven-layer uh, stack, but five-layer five layer is the most common one. Transport layer is where you have T, uh, TCP, IP, TCP protocol, right? Um, and the UDP, those are transport layer protocol. IP is a network layer protocol, right? The IP. TCP is to uh, making sure that uh, messages don't get dropped uh, without noticing, right? If something gets dropped, you have to resend it. And so there is this acknowledgement back and forth. So when I was in grad school, I, uh, my network, my network course, uh, we, the, the project, the assignments is to basically um, develop a, a, a TCP protocol. Okay, so you just, I mean, you, you keep track of uh, all the packages received and then you see, okay, one, two, three, five. Oh, you are missing four. And then you have to ask the other party, can you resend the four? And so, so none of this is about security. And so, um, and of course, because network was invented at that time, security wasn't a thing. And so it was sort of like an add-on, TIS is an add-on. Um, and, um, and, and by the way, network stack, the reason it's, it's not a big blob is has this layers is because some, uh, it's, this modularization is easier for entities to manage data. For example, some routers, they just, they only decode up to data link le level. They, they can read um, MAC address. They don't have to care about IP, you know, like internal, uh, uh, area network. Uh, if you go on to the outside network and, and they don't have to know the uh, HTTP level, they only de decode to the network IP level. So, so it's very convenient. It's just a management. Um, uh, it's for the scalability. So, uh, you will see HTTPS, that's just uh, HTTP plus TLS. Okay, but then TLS can be used in man by many other applications. Uh, uh, browser is one. But then, you know, email is another application that can build on top of TLS. Um, and, uh, you know, some chat protocols can also use TLS. And so, so different applications can, can all enjoy TLS. Um, and um, so TLS, I want to say a little bit about TLS. And when we talk about network security, we're going to say a bit more. Um, and by that time, you will know more about uh, cryptography, but, but right now I want to just say a little bit about the concept, which is easy to, relatively easy to understand. Um, and then the more we talk about it, the more you are familiar with it. So TLS use public key encryption. Okay, so we, when we talk about um, cipher, you know, permutation substitution, we said that was a symmetric encryption there's the sender and the receiver have the same key. They have the same key for encryption and decryption. Um, and, uh, but here is a public key encryption that may, meaning that encryption is, you encrypt with someone's public key, okay? So Alice encrypt a message or a secret using the server's public key, assuming she has it. And then the server has the, a key pair. The key pair generated ahead of time and then keep the private key secret. And the Alice message will be decrypted by the server using the server's private key. Attacker has attacker's own public and private key, right? So anyone can generate a public and private key, a pair, okay? Anyone can generate one, uh, except the private key is not very useful. The private key cannot, the private key cannot be used to decrypt uh, the server's ciphertext, okay? Because whichever message encrypted using the server's public key has to be decrypted with the server's private key, okay? It has to match. So that's, that's basically, you know, public key. 
Um, and how does it work? We're going to talk about that um, in, in our module three. Module three. So, so a very high level TLS between, you know, it's called handshake uh, um, the, for the client to ser and server to establish connection. So the client says, hello server, and the server will send back the certificate, okay? This is interesting, right? All the, all the, the, the insecure protocols, none of them mention anything about certificate. And so at this time, the client would pick a secret, okay? Um, and then encrypt the secret using the public key of the server, which is obtained from the certificate. Hmm. Now, now we are in business because only the server can decrypt that secret now because it's encrypted using the server's public key. Um, and so, so now the server can decrypt and obtain the secret. Now we're in, we in business because the client and server both have this secret and they can use symmetric key encryption to communicate, which is extremely fast. So, um, and so well, let's, let's just, okay, this seems to be very simple, okay? And, and then it's supposed to be very secure, but then wh why is this? Why is this secure? Let's just discuss a bit more. Why is this secure? Or can this be pro become problematic? Well, things can go wrong if, uh, uh, well, it really depends on how the certificate is formed, right? So you know, it depends on step two, the server sends a certificate, and also depends on step three, what does the, the client do with the certificate? So, um, well, it sounds like if, if you're not very careful, if the client is not very careful, a client may use the wrong public key, right? Because it's, it's crucial for Alice to encrypt the secret of her choice with the, the right public key, the source public key. If Alice was um, careless and then um, obtained a wrong certificate and then didn't, uh, wasn't able to tell it, that that could mislead her into encrypting the secret with the wrong key. The wrong key could be from the attacker. So let, let's just take a step back. Let's say, okay, I'm not sure how, how secure that is, but then let me think. Uh, what if in a very naive solution, okay, a naive solution, you have a very naive certificate. Suppose you have a certificate that just say who, the, my domain name and my public key. Suppose that that's how, how the certificate, um, the only two pieces of information. Is this secure? Is this secure? Hmm. First of all, Amazon's public key is public and everyone knows it. So, I mean, this, if this is a certificate, it doesn't sound very secure, right? So you have, anyone can go to Amazon's website and obtain a, um, a public key of amazon.com because it's called public key, it has supposed to be pub, made public. So then it's, Attacker can, you know, do you using phishing and so on, trick the client into visiting its website. And then attacker has its own key pairs that attacker generate uh, on, its, on its own. And you can use whatever open SSL, whatever like library to generate key pairs. It's just some numbers. Um, but then in the meantime, attacker has no idea what is Amazon's uh, public key, okay? Uh, has no idea what is Amazon's private key. So, client says, hello. Attacker says, I'm Amazon, this is my public key. And look now, it's very important here, whose public key is this? It's the attacker's public key that's given to Alice. Okay, it's not Amazon's public key. 
Um, because we said that the certificate would just have domain name and public key, and then there's no way that anyone can tell that uh, this is not Amazon's public key, because public key look just random. And then Alice will be fooled into encrypting the secret with PubK, um, which can be decrypted by the attacker, right? So what, what, is it, what does it say? That says that the certificate, if it's only contained domain name and public key, it doesn't work. It should contain a, a bit more information, right? A bit more information, because that, otherwise anyone can switch the public key and, and you cannot tell the public key is just doesn't, has no face. Public key just look very random. So, Public key, the certificate need to have, the certificates need to have the service public key, but also some sort of endorsement from a trustworthy authority. Okay. So, and, and then be able to say, okay, this is, I'm, I'm, I have a stand, this is, this state certificate, this public key has my approval and attacker's public key does not have my approval. Okay. This one, it's a correct public key of Amazon. So some sort of a, 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 a endorsement, okay. That's indeed the case. That's indeed the case, okay. The actual, the act, the actual public key certificate has many fields and we call it, you know, you can call it attributes or a field that has a name and has a value, right? In this case, this for the attribute of organization, it's amazon.com. It has uh, expiration date. Uh, the, but the two most important attributes are the public key and the, the digital signature of the certificate authority. That's the endorsement. That's, that's um, is some algorithm that uh, it's a digital equivalent to saying, um, oh, I approve this message. So, so then it's very important for the client to get hold of this certificate and then be able to verify it. And, and so it's very important you verify the certificate and making sure that everything all worked out. The certificate has a digital signature and a digital signature corresponding to this particular public key and the public key um, also had this uh, domain name that matches the browser that's shown on the address bar. And so now you may say, oh, I have no idea this is happening. Am I insecure? No, you're fine because your browser actually does that. Uh, behind the scene and then show the padlock. And so you don't have to do it manually. The browser does it. The browser has a, the CA's uh, public key to verify that the signature is valid, okay? And then do all the matching comparison. So, so that's very important, okay? So the step three is very, very, very important, in that, you know, because, um, this is the, the bootstrapping pay, phase. Bootstrapping means that you have, you, you have to trust something, okay? And in this case, we have implicit trust of the certificate authority. So, um, so this, is, this is the full step. Full, this is the full step. Um, so a little bit about the certificate authority, right? So what's so magic about them? N nothing magic. They're just uh, some companies who makes money out of generating digital documents. Um, so it's, it's actually quite good business. Um, and although a lot of time that it, it, you know, there's also um, cheaper alternatives and so um, in but and sometimes the certificate lasts for like two years and you don't you don't um, um, it's not like they have to regenerate certificate all the time and so um, but the certificate authority is not many uh, such organizations in the world 
and they they so so their their public keys are built into the browser. The browser knows uh, the major certificate authorities, uh, the public keys. So 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 and then some of the CA are signed by other CV, CAs. The so CA has levels as well. Um, but eventually you have to trust someone. Okay, the root CA. So the browser has it, um, and the. Uh, regularly, all the servers, you know, Virginia Tech, they get in touch with some CAs and obtain their digital certificates. Um, so, so the public key has expiration date. Once you have a new public key, you get it signed. You get it signed, digitally signed. Um, and then you think of the certificate as an endorsement of the public key. Uh, and in, in the particular, in the endorsement is not a stamp. In the physical world, you, you see a stamp and you see some, you know, watermark and, and so on. But, but this is just a, some long string, some bits. But then it's not just a, some random bits. And those are signatures that you can verify. Um, so, um, and so, so this is this is called public key infrastructure, PKI. PKI is what enable the internet. Um, without PKI, without this infrastructure, okay, this sort of agreement between all the servers and the CAs that we're going to do this protocol regularly and, and so then you will not be able to have a secure communication. Okay. Um, and so we say you call the infrastructure because it's sort of um, like, like highways and it's enable communication, information highway. So, so that's, that's very high level explanation of TLS. TLS is very important, the only way to secure and, and to achieve end-to-end -end communication, okay? Um, in particular, achieve CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and authenticity. Um, a couple of mental exercises, and I think this is gonna be very interesting. I, we talk about security, part of it is to let you know that what's happening, how things are, are secured, but then part of it, I want you to think how things could be secured differently, right? So don't just accept all these solutions. Ask why not this way? Why not that way, right? So, and then that will allow you to see um, the, the beauty uh, in the existing solution or the, or the deficiencies. Um, and so I, I do encourage you, uh, don't just passively accept to think. So a couple of uh, thinking points for the, the TLS. How, how can you build the TLS alternatives? We said that the, the browser stores some CA's public keys. So then maybe the browser can remember all the surface public keys. Okay, so maybe um, all the universities, all the banks, all the uh, data storage, all the cloud, uh, the fast food restaurants, um, Panera Bread. And so that in that case, we don't need, we just don't have to um, do the certificate. The browser, which we trust, has some way of finding out the public keys and then uh, we'll just encrypt, we start by encrypting the secret using the, the public key that we know. Does this work? Well, in what scenario this would work? In what scenarios this would not work? So, how many servers are there? And how often do they change their public keys? your browser will be exhausted keeping track of this information, right? Um, so um, it's just not very scalable. And, not, and the browser is actually not that smart, okay? So, um, but think, think, 
How about this? How about this alternative? Why not have a gigantic server storing all these domain and public key pairs? And then everyone in the world can query it. Um, you can submit a query to this gigantic server. Say, gigantic server, please tell me the public key of www.amazon.com. Or say, please tell me the public key of Virginia Tech, vt.edu. Does this work? Mm, well, if there is such a gigantic server, it it may it I mean it certainly can work, but however, it may not be scalable. If everybody in the world before they surf the web, they have to visit this server, then then it's just too much traffic. Second of all, who is going to host him? Who, who, is, who has the money to host this, right? You're essentially doing services and uh, who, who, like, who pays for the electricity? I mean, there are a lot of uh, economic aspect of it. And second, and, and then last uh, but not least, is this going to be secure? If you're a hacker, is this going to be the first thing you want to attack? Probably yes, because once you disrupt the server, nobody else can serve because they just cannot find out the public key and, and then they, they don't, they cannot enter their password because before they enter password, they have to certificate, they have to uh, authenticate the server. It's just everything falls apart. So, um, and, and, but this is very interesting if you think of DNS domain name service, it has many hierarchies, it's distributed, decentralized and distributed. Many, many servers doing the same similar jobs and, and just to prevent this kind of single point of failure scenarios. So, so think a little bit, a little bit more about this and, and then, you know, just to justify why the current design is the best one. And a lot of times that whatever works on paper may not work in practice. Um, so uh, think of other, other alternatives, other TLS alternatives. And, and, and this is for a long time, people has been searching for TLS alternatives. One of them is Bank of America, who, who is just, who has very brave security team. Um, and then they thought that hmm, maybe we can achieve this mutual authentication in a, in a cheap way. Okay. So, so from, for almost 10 years, they invent, they uh, has this deployed solution called SiteKey. SiteKey, of course, so, is able to prevent some naive type of phishing websites, but then it is completely uh, insecure um, against uh, man in the middle attacks. So let's let's explain first what site key is. Site key um, is a picture where a user selected the one their account when the, the user's account was created. Uh, and then the picture was selected among a whole bunch of choices. And so it's very difficult. It's relatively difficult for an attacker to guess the particular picture a user picked. And so I may pick waterfall, you may pick a cat, um, someone else may pick a hockey and uh, who knows. So, uh, the idea is that when the user log on to Bank of America, the user's job is to first not to check the padlock. Who cares about padlock and the certificate? But to check whether this image showing up on the website matches the one uh, that the user picked. And this is assuming the user has entered the username. Okay. So, so this, this sounds very intuitive, however, um, in a naive phishing website, certainly it will be defeated, but consider a scenario like this. Okay, so follow the steps. 
starting from one. So suppose a user may be folding into clicking a phishing email, end up visiting a phishing website, but this is, this is a sophisticated phishing um, website. It's, it's dynamic, okay. Uh, it asks the user's username and, and then pass the username to the real Bank of America website. And then at this point, the server would uh, return the site key from the BOA uh, database. And now the man, the middle uh, attacker has everything it needs. It put up the phishing websites with the site key, right? And the user on the other side it, it will see, oh, th this is the waterfall that I picked. And then everything else is just the same as a regular man in the middle attack and you know, user enter the password, the password passed to Bank of America, Bank of America even says, oh, welcome, Bob. And then everything is being relayed uh, by the attacker. That's it. So, so it, it's, it's completely vulnerable to man in the middle attacks. The side key doesn't work. It's very important to know that the only way, the only way to prevent man-in-the-middle attack to achieve CIA is to use TLS, use digital certificate and public key encryption. Every other workaround makeshift solution um, doesn't work. And of course, uh, HTTPS, TLS doesn't prevent a DOS attack. It's not for availability, right? Uh, it's for authentication, for confidentiality, for integrity. Okay, we're we're gonna uh, we'll explain these uh, a bit more, um, but now just um, think of, think try to accept this. But we're gonna say more why it works, and and this is relatively com complex concept, and so we do have to say it again and again and again. Um. So. So that's it for server authentication, okay? So we, we started by saying, okay, who authenticate first? And then we say, okay, client um, is more vulnerable. We have to have the server authenticate first. Um, and by the way, client can authenticate first, but then the problem is that client usually does not have a public key certificate, right? And doesn't have, doesn't have to. Um, so, so we have the server because if they're relatively smaller number of servers. So server goes first. Um, and then we tried a whole bunch of different ways that doesn't work and then end up uh, agree upon that TLS is a way to go. So, and then we explain the P PK and so on. Uh, one, the other side would be how to authenticate the client, which is last time is very easy is password. And password has been proven again and again and again. It's easy to crack. And, and, and so multi-factor uh, authentication is the way to go. It's, it's uh, substantially improving the security. Um, in terms of client-side authentication. And, and the funny thing is that it's if you say, okay, multi-factor authentication, um, something you are, like biometric authentication, it doesn't work on servers, right? You, you know, you, you can use fingerprints, iris scan, uh, voice authentication, keystroke authentication, um, that's, those are something you are, right? Some, some part of you, um, and you can also have something you have that's a smartphone, multi-factor authentication, multi-factor authentication that we currently are deploying at Virginia Tech. Um, so so those, are, those are very conven relatively convenient for client-side authentication. Um, it just to make it harder, make it harder uh, for hackers to intercept and then to impersonate you. Um, something you know that's obviously password. I have, uh, a while ago, I did um, research on keystroke authentication. That is, people find out when you type, you have some rhythm. And your rhythm 
is different from my rhythm. And so, so you can um, tell who this person is by looking at how long I hold down a key, how long I transition to the next key. And, and so that turns out to be um, relatively accurate as an authentication mechanism. And so it's just fascinating. Um, and although nowadays with neural networks, it's gonna be tough <laughs> because people put up images of fake images, fake videos. Uh, um, there was, even without neural network, there was a, uh, we, we also, my lab also did this little test that you can fool a facial authentication system by putting up a photo of you um, or a photo of um, someone else. Um, you cannot tell this is a live person or um, a photo. And of course, you know, think, okay, how can I improve this? Maybe I can do infrared um, and then be able to, um, to, to, to know this, you know, li lively test. And so, so authentication in general is just a fascinating topic. Um, authentication, uh, we probably will be able to say a little bit more next class uh, on uh, authentication and authorization. Um, a little bit more about um, different ways of authenticating you. Uh, there was a, a while ago, I also did some research that Authenticate, authenticate based on activities. I call it activity-based authentication. So if you um, have, if you, you, we are able to extract information from your emails, okay? Your emails has your calendar and then so, so then that information can be used to generate questions and then you ask the user, okay, um, can, how, how can you prove yourself by answering where you were last Sunday, okay? And then the correct answer is in the calendar. And so, so that, that way you um, um, make, you know, you're leveraging something you know, okay? Something you know, but then this is not password, it keep changing. So um, that is, it just has a lot of fun. And, and I think that by itself may not be, uh, it's, it's actually quite, it, it's being used and, and you know, if, when you get older, you apply for mortgage and the banks and they will say, can you pick from the following zip code and the location uh, um, um, the, the places that can you identify the places you've lived, lived before? And, and so um, they, because they use this, they, they generate the information from your past transactions, you know, like Equifax and they, they know where you lived and, and so on. So, so you don't have to tell them, you don't have to like set up the correct answer, they just know. Um, sometimes they know more than you because you kind of forget. I, I forgot, I've been to so many places, so many zip codes. Um, but, but they also have a choice, you know, none of the above. And also if you fail, they keep asking you again and again. <laughs> and and so, uh, until you, you, you have uh, answered the, the, the sufficient number of correct uh, questions. Um, so this by itself is not very secure. Um, and um, in a lot of times that those kind of memory-based questions can be spoofed. Um, um, in some people put up their, their public information out there and, and, and there's just so many websites that are, uh, keep track of public information. So it's just very scary. Um, so so well, if, if you, your biggest fear is identity theft, then freeze your credit account at uh, credit agencies. So if you put a freeze, anyone who attempted to apply mortgages under your name will not be able to create, uh, obtain your credit score. Um, so, so that I think is very, very useful. And, and how many times you buy cars and, and houses? Not very many. And if you, uh, you just have to unfreeze the account. So, so I think in general, this is very useful. 
uh, freezing error count is very, very useful. Um, all right, so a, a bit more of the recap of all these interesting concepts. Um, as, a, as a small summary, um, we talked about the paradox of uh, security, right? So you, on one hand, you want to enable access. You don't want to lock people out of their account all the time, but on the other hand, you want to um, protect the server, server and services. Um, in similar thing, path, firewalls and and uh, it's just it's 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 conflicting. Okay, you you constantly work compromise, take compromise, and then you you balance and you do trade offs. Um, that that's just an, the nature of security. Um, and then we talk about security and safety. They are different because security have active attackers. Um, and a lot of times that when uh, it, this conflict uh, rise up in horrible sin situations, uh, um, Hurricane Katrina back in 2005 was of course extremely devastating part of it is that people find that different organization from the government are not set up to share information, uh, making it extremely difficult to, uh, for the rescue uh, mission. Uh, part of New Orleans is eight feet below sea level. Can you imagine that? And, and then the, the levee uh, was breached in 2005 after Hurricane Katrina, and so uh, caused uh, just unbelievable damage and devastation. Um, and so so I, I, I said this because I want to consistently, you know, uh, deliver this message that we, as a technology um, experts, you will become technology experts, you do have to keep in mind that the people. We are, we are building security uh, technologies and then eventually it's the, uh, to help the human society. And so, so lots of times that when you are immersed in this technology world, you forget there's actually human elements in, in it. And so, so do remember um, there's, there, you know, down the road that what are the, the consequences. And so uh, part of it is, um, you know, how, how do you enable organizations to share information while securing the information, right? So, so this, again, this is very conflicting part of it. Um, of cybersecurity it, it, because it's easy to secure things. You just do unplug your ethernet cable, turn off your internet and you turn off the power. Nobody does anything. It's extremely secure. But then on the other hand, it's also impossible to do in this age. Uh, if you haven't done the exercise about the padlock, check the certificate, key size, domain name service, so please do. Um, and uh, the summary is due today for last week's summary. Um, I think that's it for today. Last slide is to uh, always remember on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. It's, it's, it, it's very important to authenticate the communicating parties, validate input from the internet, just to trust no one, okay, trust no one on the internet. All right, that's it for today. Thank you so much. Goodbye.